father ascends into the mysteries of the Great Wall and the Great Attractor. Good evening. This is National Astronomy Week, with events taking place all over the country. Our main theme this time is light pollution. The skies are getting brighter, and for scientific reasons, we want to keep the skies as dark as possible. And certainly, you need dark skies to see the first object I want to talk about now, and that is Messier 31, the Andromeda Spiral. You can see it with the naked eye if you know where to look and if the sky is really dark. First, find the square of Pegasus, which you'll see high up in the south. Leading away from Pegasus is the line of stars marking Andromeda. And Messier 31 is here. With the naked eye, a very dim patch. Binoculars show it easily, and when you photograph it with a large telescope, you can see it in great detail. It's actually a spiral galaxy, so far away that its light, travelling at 186,000 miles a second, takes over two million years to reach us. It is, in fact, larger than our own Milky Way galaxy. And we live in a spiral. In fact, our sun is way out towards the edge. And when we look along the main thickness of our flattened galaxy, we see many stars in almost the same direction, and that causes the lovely band of the Milky Way. Our galaxy and the Andromeda spiral are members of what we call the local group of galaxies. And another member is the spiral in Triangulum, in the same part of the sky, uh, Messier 33. Not nearly so bright as M31, and rather further away, and considerably smaller, and it's a rather loose kind of spiral. But you will see it with binoculars, if you look in the right place, and if the sky is really dark. Well, these are members of the local group, and there are other members too, more than two dozen of them, including the southern clouds of Magellan, which sadly we can't see from here. But our local group is only one of many, and some are much larger than ours. More than 50 million light years away, we see the Virgo cluster of galaxies containing many hundreds of systems. And further away still, at something like 200 million light years, we see the Coma cluster. And these clusters, like our own group, contain galaxies of all kinds. Some of them are spiral. They're the lovely Whirlpool galaxy in the constellation of the hunting dogs. Others are elliptical such as this one, the companion of Messier 31. So galaxies come in various kinds. But these views are in ordinary light. And nowadays, we can also study them at very long wavelengths in the infrared. In 1983, a satellite was launched, IRS, the Infrared Astronomical Satellite. It operated for most of 1983 and sent back invaluable data. At this stage, I'm delighted to introduce to the sky at night Professor Michael Rowan Robinson of Queen Mary and Westfield College. Welcome to the sky at night, Michael. Thank you. First of all, in your own particular line of research, why is IRS so important? Well, IRS is important because uh, in the infrared, we, we see uh, the universe without any obscuration from interstellar dust. So here's a, here, for example, is the famous coal sack, which is a totally black area because dust is cutting out the light from the distant stars. In the infrared, we, we, we uh, don't have that obscuration. And secondly, it's important because uh, at long wavelengths, it turns out that most of the sources we're seeing are galaxies. Altogether, IRS detected some 80,000 galaxies, so it is the, the deepest uh, galaxy catalogue covering the whole sky that astronomers have. What exactly is what is normally known as an IRS galaxy? Uh, well, mainly they're spiral galaxies. We don't see, uh, we generally don't see much emission from elliptical galaxies. Uh, and what we're seeing is emission from dust spread between the stars. There's M31 again. Yes. And uh, basically the dust absorbs the, the light from the stars and then re-emits it in the infrared. And in, in M31, we see very prominently in the infrared here, this ring of emission, which is associated with a, a, a ring of newly formed stars. Well, I take it that the clusters of galaxies look very different when you examine them in the infrared. They do. Uh, in, at optical wavelengths, we see uh, a core, a, a concentrated core of galaxies, mainly ellipticals, 
Uh, in the infrared, however, we see a much larger halo of spiral galaxies uh, as, with a radius as much as 100 million light years, much larger than the, 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 what we were seeing earlier in Virgo and Coma. Well, we know that the universe is expanding. All the groups of galaxies are going away from all the other groups. So it's a universal expansion. And this obviously has an effect upon the spectra. When you look at the spectrum of a galaxy, it shows dark lines. And if those are red-shifted, tilted over to the long wave end of the spectrum, it means that the galaxy is going away from us. What do your um, redshift studies of IRS galaxies tell you? Well, with, uh, my colleagues and I have been uh, making a survey of some thousands of IRS galaxies using ground-based optical telescopes. And we've been measuring the spectra of these galaxies and uh, determining the redshifts, that's to say their recession velocities. And as you say, in an expanding universe, the recession velocity is proportional to the distance of the galaxy. Uh, so the further the galaxy is away, the faster it is moving away from us. So in this way, we, get, we are able to make um, a three-dimensional map of a large volume of the universe, a radius about 2,000 million light years. And in that volume, we can map out all the, clusters of, all the large clusters of galaxies. Well, can we come now to the famous microwave background? Discovered in the 1960s by two American astronomers, Penzias and Wilson, using this rather strange horn antenna. They were looking for something entirely different, and they found, to their surprise, that they were picking up weak radiation coming in from all parts of the sky. Now, we believe that the universe, in its present form, was created sometime between 15,000 million and 20,000 million years ago, and it was very, very hot. And apparently, what this horn antenna was picking up was the faint echo of the original Big Bang. So we have the background radiation. Michael, what do these new results tell us about the background radiation and our own galaxy's motion through it? Well, first of all, another uh, satellite launched in 1989, COBE, shows very clearly that the microwave background is the relic of this hot phase of the Big Bang. The universe was born in a blaze of light uh, virtually infinite intensity, and matter played a very minor part in the early stages of the universe. About a million years after the Big Bang, the radiation had cooled down sufficiently for matter to start to collect together under gravity and form galaxies and clusters. Uh, so when we look at the microwave background, we're looking at this moment one million years after the Big Bang. And there are two uh, striking things about the radiation. The first is that it's incredibly smooth. In whichever direction we look in, we see more or less the same intensity to, to within one part in 100,000 or so. The second thing is that there is one uh, departure from this smoothness, and that is that if we look in one direction on the sky, the radiation looks slightly hotter, slightly brighter, and in the opposite direction, it looks slightly colder, slightly dimmer. And in this picture, this uh, anisotropy has been exaggerated. The it's red a false color. The, the false color picture. The false color picture. And the red parts denote the, the hotter, brighter direction, and the blue parts the, the cooler, fainter direction. The actual effect is only about one part in a thousand. The most natural explanation of this effect is that our galaxy and the other galaxies of the local group are moving together through space at a speed of about 600 kilometers a second. Now, this was a, gr a great has been a great puzzle for cosmologists because it was a much higher speed than was expected. And a few years ago, uh, some astronomers came up with the suggestion that the reason for this motion is that we are being pulled by the Great Attractor. We've heard a great deal about the Great Attractor. What exactly was it meant to be? Well, it's meant to be some a huge concentration of galaxies, much bigger than uh, an ordinary cluster. Uh, most of it hidden from view behind the, the dust of the Milky Way, um, pulling us through space. Now, our RS survey allows us to map out all the clusters within the, the, the local part of the universe and also to estimate how much these clusters are pulling us. You have to think of the clusters as uh, in motion with respect to one another, pulling each other uh, and uh, also pulling us. And if we add up the net pull from all these clusters that we found in our survey, then the direction that we're being pulled is indeed the same direction that we're moving in. And so uh, we believe there's absolutely uh, no necessity anymore for uh, this great attractor. Basically, 
we're being pulled by the clusters that we see, although these clusters are somewhat larger than we thought before. Mm -hmm. So there isn't a single great attractor? No, I'm afraid not. You know, I'm rather sorry about that. It was such a lovely idea, wasn't it? But there it is. Science is sometimes unromantic. Now, Michael, let's now look at an even larger scale. We know that we have our local group, the Virgo cluster, the Coma cluster, and many others, but they make up parts of even larger supergroups, do they not? Yes, if we look at uh, slices of our three-dimensional maps made from the IRS survey, then uh, we can see the clusters of galaxies. In, the, in this picture, the red areas denote regions of high galaxy density. And uh, you can see the Virgo cluster, uh, the Hydra cluster nearby, and then not far away, the Centaurus cluster. And uh, in fact, these three clusters merge into each other. Now, these slices are shown with a separation of 30 million light years. Now if we move to a larger separation, so it's as if we're moving away and viewing it, the whole thing from a greater distance, you see that the three clusters have really merged into a single object. And if we move to an even larger scale, so this is now the spacing of 120 million light years, all the clusters in our survey more or less merge into a single huge object about 500 million light years across. Now this fits in very well with a recent discovery by the Harvard astronomers of a thing called the Great Wall. What exactly is the Great Wall? Well, it's a sh huge sheet of galaxies about 300 million light years long, stretching from the Coma Cluster here in the center uh, along to the Hercules Cluster at the edge of this picture. Well, if there's one Great Wall, then presumably there are many others. And that must mean that there, there are voids, huge areas where there are almost no galaxies at all. Yes, that's right. A number of voids have been discovered. And, and in our, on our three-dimensional maps, you can see some of them. The, the voids are the blue areas. These are the areas of below average galaxy density. And in fact, the, the, these voids join up to make very large empty regions. Isn't it rather hard to understand how that kind of arrangement is going to form in the first place? It seems very strange to me. Well, yes, it's a real headache for cosmologists. Um, you remember that the, the microwave background is incredibly smooth, and this shows that uh, matter had made very little progress towards starting to form uh, galaxies and clusters at this time, a million years after the Big Bang. So uh, uh, gravity needs time to, to form these structures, and although the universe is incredibly old, uh, it, it just seems there, is, there wouldn't be time to make clusters out of ordinary matter. So. Uh, Cosmologists have come up with uh, a couple of ideas to, to help solve this problem. And the first one is that uh, uh, if we had some kind of dark matter, uh, which is completely different from the, the ordinary matter that, uh, that we're made of, and the, and the world is made of, and so on, uh, some, some kind of uh, exotic matter that doesn't interact with radiation, then uh, the, this matter could have begun to collect together into uh, concentrations uh, which uh, would later form to clusters uh, at the time uh, that we're looking at the microwave background without violating the smoothness of the, of the, of the radiation. So then um, once the ordinary matter is, is freed from the shackles of the radiation to, to start condensing, uh, it does so, to, it starts to feel the gravity of these lumps of dark matter and starts to fall together to make clusters. Now, um, the, this also fits in with a second uh, exotic idea of cosmologists, and that's in inflationary theory. Uh, the, here the, the aim is to explain the remarkable fact that when we look at different directions in the sky, at the microwave background, uh, we're looking at regions of the universe that have never been in communication with each other, apparently. So how did they know they had to be so identically the same. Well, scientists don't like to say, well, that's just how it, how it was made. Uh, they want an explanation. And so they've come up with this uh, remarkable picture in which the whole, of the, uh, the whole of the universe, very shortly after the Big Bang, a minute fraction of a second after the Big Bang, suddenly went through this period of immense inflation. And so a small seed, uh, smaller than an atom, suddenly is inflated in a very short time 
to be as large as the whole observable universe today. This whole process is over in about one, in less, much less than one second after the Big Bang. And uh, the colossal energy to make this inflation happen comes in some mysterious way understood only by particle physicists from the vacuum itself. Well, it turns out that inflationary theory uh, predicts that the average density of the universe today should be much higher than we see in the form of ordinary matter in, in the galaxies. And so inflation also needs some form of dark matter. And interestingly, uh, our IRS survey also seems to point to a higher density of matter in the universe than, than is in the form of ordinary matter. Well, uh, in spite of bringing in these wonderful ideas of dark matter and inflation, uh, I mean, these, these did explain how galaxies and clusters could form. But now, with these new structures that are appearing, the Great Wall and the large structures we're seeing with IRS, these do not fit in with this picture anymore. And so it looks like we have to find a new picture of how galaxies form. And just to add to our problems, uh, a colleague of mine at Queen Mary and Westfield College, Tom Broadhurst, and his colleagues have come up with a, with a remarkable result on the regularity of the galaxy distribution. They've made a survey towards the galactic poles, and they seem to find a periodicity in the galaxy distribution every 400 million light years. It's as if every 400 million light years we see a new cell of the universe. Well, this is totally incomprehensible idea at present. And that's going to be very hard to explain, I think, but well, certainly seems to exist. Well, the IRS satellite itself is now dead, sadly. What about future infrared satellites? Well, the European Space Agency is launching the Infrared Space Observatory, ISO, in the spring of 1993, and that will be ten times more sensitive than IRS, so that's a very exciting prospect. Do you really feel that with all these new, new techniques, we are now starting to have a really reliable look back at the very early history of the universe? Well, only very indirectly, I'm afraid. Uh, I mean, the galaxies didn't form till several hundred million years after the Big Bang, so that's not looking very far back. Uh, the microwave background radiation, with the microwave background radiation, we're looking at a time a million years after the Big Bang. If we look at the abundances of the light elements, helium, deuterium, and lithium, these were made in the fireball phase of the Big Bang about one minute after the Big Bang, so that's getting a bit earlier. Uh, however, these, the structures that we see, uh, clusters and, and even larger structures, were almost certainly the product of processes in the very earliest uh, phases of the Big Bang, the first minute fraction of a second. So yes, we are looking back indirectly to those very earliest times. All quite fascinating. Michael, thank you very much. But there is one thing we, we must remember. We are fairly certain now that the universe, as we know it, began at some period between 15,000 million and 20,000 million years ago in a Big Bang. That seems to be pretty well established. But what caused the Big Bang? That, frankly, is something we don't know. We can trace the story of the universe from its very early days, but we don't know how it was actually created. Whether we ever will, well, I don't know. But certainly, we don't know yet. Perhaps one day, we'll find out. Good night. National Astronomy Week, light pollution is a major issue. The sight of stars and galaxies is becoming more obscured because of the glow of light from badly directed street lamps. Antenna goes to Tucson, Arizona, where the dark sky campaign began. <laughs>